Moby Dick, Chapters 83 to 86. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 83 to 86. Chapter 83. Jonah Historically Regarded Reference was made to the historical story of Jonah and the Whale in the preceding chapter. Now, some Nantucketers rather distrust this historical story of Jonah and the Whale, but then there were some skeptical Greeks and Romans who, standing out from the orthodox pagans of their times, equally doubted the story of Hercules and the Whale, and Arion and the Dolphin, and yet their doubting those traditions did not make those traditions one whit the less facts for all that. One old Sag Harbor whaleman's chief reason for questioning the Hebrew story was this. He had one of those quaint, old-fashioned Bibles, embellished with curious, unscientific plates, one of which represented Jonah's whale with two spouts in his head a peculiarity only true with respect to a species of the leviathan the right whale and varieties of that order concerning which the fishermen have this saying a penny roll would choke him his swallow is so very small but to this bishop jeb's anticipative answer is ready it is not necessary hence the bishop that we consider jonah as tombed in the whale's belly but as temporarily lodged in some part of his mouth and this seems reasonable enough in the good bishop, for truly the right whale's mouth would accommodate a couple of whist tables, and comfortably seat all the players. Possibly, too, Jonah might have ensconced himself in a hollow tooth, but on second thoughts the right whale is toothless. Another reason which Sag Harbor, he went by that name, urged for his want of faith in this matter of the prophet, was something obscurely in reference to his incarcerated body and the whale's gastric juices. But this objection likewise falls to the ground, because a German exegetist supposes that Jonah must have taken refuge in the floating body of a dead whale, even as the French soldiers in the Russian campaign turned their dead horses into tents and crawled into them. Besides, it has been divined by other continental commentators that when Jonah was thrown overboard from the Joppa ship, he straightway effected his escape to another vessel nearby, some vessel with a whale for a figurehead, and, I would add, possibly called the whale, as some craft nowadays are christened the shark, the gull, the eagle. Nor have there been wanting learned exegetists who have opined that the whale mentioned in the book of Jonah merely meant a life-preserver, an inflated bag of wind, which the endangered prophet swam to, and so was saved from a watery doom. Poor Sag Harbor, therefore, seems worsted all round. But he had still another reason for his want of faith. It was this, if I remember right, Jonah was swallowed by the whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and after three days he was vomited up somewhere within three days' journey of Nineveh, a city on the Tigris, very much more than three days' journey across from the nearest point of the Mediterranean coast. How is that? But was there no other way for the whale to land the prophet within that short distance of Nineveh? Yes, he might have carried him round by the way of the Cape of Good Hope but not to speak of the passage through the whole length of the Mediterranean, and another passage up the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, such a supposition would involve the complete circumnavigation of all Africa in three days, not to speak of the Tigris waters near the site of Nineveh being too shallow for any whale to swim in. Besides, this idea of Jonah's weathering the Cape of Good Hope at so early a day would wrest the honor of the discovery of that great headland from Bartholomew Diaz, its reputed discoverer, and so make modern history a liar. But all these foolish arguments of old Sag Harbor only evinced his foolish pride of reason, a thing still more reprehensible in him, seeing that he had but little learning except what he had picked up from the sun and the sea. 
I say it only shows his foolish, impious pride, and abominable, devilish rebellion against the reverend clergy. For by a Portuguese Catholic priest, this very idea of Jonah's going to Nineveh, via the Cape of Good Hope, was advanced as a signal magnification of the general miracle. And so it was. Besides, to this day, the highly enlightened Turks devoutly believe in the historical story of Jonah. And some three centuries ago, an English traveller, in old Harris's voyages, speaks of a Turkish mosque built in honour of Jonah, in which mosque was a miraculous lamp that burnt without any oil. Chapter 84 Pitch Poling to make them run easily and swiftly, the axles of carriages are anointed, and for much the same purpose some whalers perform an analogous operation upon their boat. They grease the bottom. Nor is it to be doubted that as such a procedure can do no harm, it may possibly be of no contemptible advantage, considering that oil and water are hostile, that oil is a sliding thing, and that the object in view is to make the boat slide bravely. Queequeg believes strongly in anointing his boat, and one morning, not long after the German ship Jungfrau disappeared, took more than customary pains in that occupation, crawling under its bottom where he hung over the side, and rubbing in the unctuousness as though diligently seeking to ensure a crop of hair from the craft's bald keel, he seemed to be working in obedience to some particular presentiment. Nor did it remain unwarranted by the event. Towards noon, whales were raised, but so soon as the ship sailed down to them, they turned and fled with swift precipitancy, a disordered flight as of Cleopatra's barges from Actium. Nevertheless, the boats pursued, and Stubbs was foremost, by great exertion, Tashtego at last succeeded in planting one iron, but the stricken whale, without at all sounding, still continued his horizontal flight, with added fleetness. Such unintermitted strainings upon the planted iron must sooner or later inevitably extract it. It became imperative to lance the flying whale, or be content to lose him. But to haul the boat up to his flank was impossible, he swam so fast and furious. What then remained? Of all the wondrous devices and dexterities, the slights of hand and countless subtleties to which the veteran whaleman is so often forced, none exceed that fine maneuver with the lance called pitch-poling. Small sword or broadsword, in all its exercises, boasts nothing like it. It is only indispensable with an inveterate running whale, its grand fact and feature is the wonderful distance to which the long lance is accurately darted from a violently rocking, jerking boat, under extreme headway. Steel and wood included, the entire spear is some ten or twelve feet in length, the staff is much slighter than that of the harpoon, and also of lighter material, pine. It is furnished with a small rope called a warp, of considerable length, by which it can be hauled back to the hand after darting. But before going further, it is important to mention here, that though the harpoon may be pitch-poled in the same way with the lance, yet it is seldom done, and when done it is still less frequently successful, on account of the greater weight and inferior length of the harpoon as compared with the lance, which, in effect, become serious drawbacks. As a general thing, therefore, you must first get fast to a whale before any pitch-poling comes into play. Look now at Stubb, a man who, from his humorous, deliberate coolness and equanimity in the direst emergencies, was specially qualified to excel in pitch-poling. Look at him. He stands upright in the tossed bow of the flying boat, wrapped in fleecy foam. The towing whale is forty feet ahead handling the long lance lightly, glancing twice or thrice along its length to see if it be exactly straight, Stubb whistlingly gathers up the coil of the warp in one hand, so as to secure its free end in his grasp, leaving the rest unobstructed. Then, holding the lance full before his waistband's middle, he levels it at the whale. 
when, covering him with it, he steadily depresses the butt-end in his hand, thereby elevating the point till the weapon stands fairly balanced upon his palm, fifteen feet in the air. He minds you somewhat of a juggler, balancing a long staff on his chin. Next moment, with a rapid, nameless impulse, in a superb, lofty arch, the bright steel spans the foaming distance and quivers in the life-spot of the whale. Instead of sparkling water, he now spouts red blood. "'That drove the spigot out of him,' cried Stubb. "'Tis July's immortal fourth. All fountains must run wine to-day. Would now it were old New Orleans whiskey or old Ohio, or unspeakable old Monongahela. Then, Tashtego, lad, I'd have you hold a canakin to the jet, and we'd drink round of it. Yea, verily, heart's alive, we'd brew choice punch in the spread of his spout-hole there. From that live punch-bowl quaff the living stuff. Again and again, to such gamesome talk, the dexterous dart is repeated, the spear returning to its master like a greyhound held in skilful leash. The agonized whale goes into his flurry, the tow-line is slackened, and the pitch-poler, dropping astern, folds his hands and mutely watches the monster die. CHAPTER 85 THE FOUNTAIN that for six thousand years, and no one knows how many millions of ages before, the great whale should have been spouting all over the sea, and sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep, as with so many sprinkling or mystifying pots, and that for some centuries back thousands of hunters should have been close by the fountain of the whale, watching these sprinklings and spoutings, that all this should be, and yet that down to this blessed minute, fifteen and a quarter minutes past one o'clock p.m. of this sixteenth day of December, A.D. 1851, it should still remain a problem whether these spoutings are, after all, really water, or nothing but vapor, this is surely a noteworthy thing. Let us then look at this matter, along with some interesting items contingent. Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribes in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim. Hence a herring or cod might live a century, and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world. But he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth, for in his ordinary attitude the sperm whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface, and, what is still more, his windpipe has no connection with his mouth. No, he breathes through his spiracle alone, and this is on the top of his head." If I say that in any creature, breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality, inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element, which being subsequently brought into contact with the blood, imparts to the blood its vivifying principle, I do not think I shall err, though I may possibly use some superfluous scientific words. Assume it, and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated in one breath, he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time. That is to say, he would then live without breathing. Anomalous as it may seem, this is precisely the case with the whale, who systematically lives by intervals his full hour and more, when at the bottom, without drawing a single breath, or so much as in any way inhaling a particle of air, for, remember, he has no gills. How is this? Between his ribs and on each side of his spine, he is supplied with a remarkable, involved, cretin labyrinth of vermicelli-like vessels, which vessels, when he quits the surface, are completely distended with oxygenated blood, so that, for an hour or more, a thousand fathoms in the sea, he carries a surplus stock of vitality in him, just as the camel, crossing the waterless desert, carries a surplus supply of drink for future use in its four supplementary stomachs. 
the anatomical fact of this labyrinth is indisputable, and that the supposition founded upon it is reasonable and true seems the more cogent to me when I consider the otherwise inexplicable obstinacy of that leviathan in having his spoutings out, as the fishermen phrase it. This is what I mean. If unmolested, upon rising to the surface, the sperm whale will continue there for a period of time exactly uniform with all his other unmolested risings. Say he stays eleven minutes and jets seventy times, that is, respires seventy breaths, then whenever he rises again, he will be sure to have his seventy breaths all over again, to a minute. Now if, after he fetches a few breaths, you alarm him, so that he sounds, he will be always dodging up again to make good his regular allowance of air, and not till those seventy breaths are told will he finally go down to stay out his full term below. Remark, however, that in different individuals these rates are different, but in any one they are alike. Now why should the whale thus insist upon having his spoutings out, unless it be to replenish his reservoir of air ere descending for good? How obvious is it, too, that this necessity for the whale's rising exposes him to all the fatal hazards of the chase. For not by hook or by net could this vast leviathan be caught when sailing a thousand fathoms beneath the sunlight. Not so much thy skill, then, O hunter, as the great necessities that strike the victory to thee. In man breathing is incessantly going on, one breath only serving for two or three pulsations, so that whatever other business he has to attend to, waking or sleeping, breathe he must, or die he will. But the sperm whale only breathes about one-seventh or Sunday of his time. It has been said that the whale only breathes through his spout hole. If it could truthfully be added that his spouts are mixed with water, then I opine we should be furnished with the reason why his sense of smell seems obliterated in him, for the only thing about him that at all answers to his nose is that identical spout hole, and being so clogged with two elements, it could not be expected to have the power of smelling. But owing to the mystery of the spout, whether it be water or whether it be vapour, no absolute certainty can as yet be arrived at on this head. Sure it is, nevertheless, that the sperm whale has no proper olfactories. But what does he want of them? No roses, no violets, no cologne water in the sea. Furthermore, as his windpipe solely opens into the tube of his spouting canal, and as that long canal, like the Grand Erie Canal, is furnished with a sort of locks that open and shut for the downward retention of air or the upward exclusion of water, therefore the whale has no voice, unless you insult him by saying that when he so strangely rumbles he talks through his nose. But then again, what has the whale to say? Seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. Oh, happy that the world is such an excellent listener. Now the spouting canal of the sperm whale, chiefly intended as it is for the conveyance of air, and for several feet laid along horizontally just beneath the upper surface of his head, and a little to one side, this curious canal is very much like a gas-pipe laid down in a city on one side of a street. But the question returns whether this gas-pipe is also a water-pipe. In other words, whether the spout of the sperm whale is the mere vapour of the exhaled breath, or whether that exhaled breath is mixed with water taken in at the mouth and discharged through the spiracle. It is certain that the mouth indirectly communicates with the spouting canal, but it cannot be proved that this is for the purpose of discharging water through the spiracle, because the greatest necessity for so doing would seem to be when in feeding he accidentally takes in water. But the sperm whale's food is far beneath the surface, and there he cannot spout even if he would. Besides, if you regard him very closely, and time him with your watch, you will find that when unmolested, there is an undeviating rhyme between the periods of his jets and the ordinary periods of respiration. But why pester one with all this reasoning on the subject? Speak out! 
You have seen him spout. Then declare what the spout is. Can you not tell water from air? My dear sir, in this world it is not so easy to settle these plain things. I have ever found your plain things the naughtiest of all. And as for this whale-spout, you might almost stand in it and yet be undecided as to what it is precisely. The central body of it is hidden in the snowy, sparkling mist enveloping it. And how can you certainly tell whether any water falls from it, when always, when you are close enough to a whale to get a close view of his spout, he is in a prodigious commotion, the water cascading all around him? And if at such times you should think that you really perceive drops of moisture in the spout, how do you know that they are not merely condensed from its vapor? Or how do you know that they are not those identical drops superficially lodged in the spout-hole fissure which is countersunk into the summit of the whale's head? For even when tranquilly swimming through the midday sea in a calm, with his elevated hump sun-dried as a dromedary's in the desert, even then the whale always carries a small basin of water on his head, as under a blazing sun you will sometimes see a cavity in a rock filled up with rain. Nor is it at all prudent for the hunter to be over-curious touching the precise nature of the whale-spout. It will not do for him to be peering into it and putting his face in it. You cannot go with your pitcher to this fountain and fill it and bring it away. For even when coming into slight contact with the outer vapory shreds of the jet, which will often happen, your skin will feverishly smart from the acridness of the thing so touching it. And I know one who, coming into still closer contact with the spout, whether with some scientific object in view or otherwise, I cannot say, the skin peeled off from his cheek and arm. Wherefore, among whalemen, the spout is deemed poisonous. They try to evade it. Another thing, I have heard it said, and I do not much doubt it, that if the jet is fairly spouted into your eyes, it will blind you. The wisest thing the investigator can do, then, it seems to me, is to let this deadly spout alone. Still, we can hypothesize, even if we cannot prove and establish. My hypothesis is this, that the spout is nothing but mist. And besides other reasons, to this conclusion I am impelled by considerations touching the great inherent dignity and sublimity of the sperm whale. I account him no common, shallow being, inasmuch as it is an undisputed fact that he is never found on soundings or near shores, all other whales sometimes are. He is both ponderous and profound, and I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous, profound beings, such as Plato, Pyrrho, the Devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a certain semi-visible steam while in the act of thinking deep thoughts. While composing a little treatise on eternity, I had the curiosity to place a mirror before me, and ere long saw reflected there a curious, involved worming and undulation in the atmosphere over my head, the invariable moisture of my hair, while plunged in deep thought, after six cups of hot tea in my thin shingled attic of an August noon, this seems an additional argument for the above supposition. And how nobly it raises our conceit of the mighty, misty monster, to behold him solemnly sailing through a calm tropical sea, his vast, mild head overhung by a canopy of vapour, engendered by his incommunicable contemplations, and that vapour, as you will sometimes see it, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. For, do you see, rainbows do not visit the clear air, they only irradiate vapour. And so, through all the thick mists of the dim doubts in my mind, divine intuitions now and then shoot, enkindling my fog with a heavenly ray. And for this I thank God, for all have doubts, many deny, but doubts or denials, few along with them have intuitions. Doubts of all things earthly, and intuitions of some things heavenly, this combination makes neither believer nor infidel, but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye. Chapter 86 The Tale 
Other poets have warbled the praises of the soft eye of the antelope, and the lovely plumage of the bird that never alights. Less celestial, I celebrate a tale. Reckoning the largest sized sperm whale's tail to begin at that point of the trunk where it tapers to about the girth of a man, it comprises, upon its upper surface alone, an area of at least fifty square feet. The compact round body of its root expands into two broad, firm, flat palms or flukes, gradually shoaling away to less than an inch in thickness. At the crotch or junction, these flukes slightly overlap, then sideways recede from each other like wings, leaving a wide vacancy between. In no living thing are the lines of beauty more exquisitely defined than in the crescentic borders of these flukes. At its utmost expansion in the full-grown whale, the tail will considerably exceed twenty feet across. The entire member seems a dense webbed bed of welded sinews, but cut into it and you find that three distinct strata compose it, upper, middle, and lower. The fibers in the upper and lower layers are long and horizontal, those of the middle one very short and running crosswise between the outside layers. This triune structure, as much as anything else, imparts power to the tail. To the student of old Roman walls, the middle layer will furnish a curious parallel to the thin course of tiles always alternating with the stone in those wonderful relics of the antique, and which undoubtedly contribute so much to the great strength of the masonry. But as if this vast local power in the tendinous tail were not enough, the whole bulk of the leviathan is knit over with a warp and woof of muscular fibres and filaments, which, passing on either side the loins and running down into the flukes, insensibly blend with them, and largely contribute to their might, so that in the tail the confluent measureless force of the whole whale seems concentrated to a point. Could annihilation occur to matter, this were the thing to do it. Nor does this, its amazing strength, at all tend to cripple the graceful flexion of its motions, where infantileness of ease undulates through a titanism of power. On the contrary, those motions derive their most appalling beauty from it. Real strength never impairs beauty or harmony, but it often bestows it, and in everything imposingly beautiful, strength has much to do with the magic. Take away the tied tendons that all over seem bursting from the marble in carved Hercules, and its charm would be gone. As the devout Eckerman lifted the linen sheet from the naked corpse of Goethe, he was overwhelmed with the massive chest of the man that seemed as a Roman triumphal arch. When Angelo paints even God the Father in human form, mark what robustness is there. And whatever they may reveal of the divine love in the sun, the soft, curled, hermaphroditical Italian pictures in which his idea has been most successfully embodied, these pictures, so destitute as they are of all brawniness, hint nothing of any power, but the mere negative, feminine one of submission and endurance, which, on all hands, it is conceded, form the peculiar practical virtues of his teachings. Such is the subtle elasticity of the organ I treat of, that whether wielded in sport or in earnest, or in anger, whatever be the mood it be in, its flexions are invariably marked by exceeding grace. Therein no fairy's arm can transcend it. Five great motions are peculiar to it. First, when used as a fin for progression. Second, when used as a mace in battle. Third, in sweeping fourth in lobtailing, fifth in peaking flukes. First, being horizontal in its position, the leviathan's tail acts in a different manner from the tails of all other sea creatures. It never wriggles. In man or fish, wriggling is a sign of inferiority. To the whale, his tail is the sole means of propulsion, scroll-wise coiled forwards beneath the body, and then rapidly sprung backwards, it is this which gives that singular darting, leaping motion to the monster when furiously swimming. His side-fins only serve to steer by. 
Second, it is a little significant that while one sperm whale only fights another sperm whale with his head and jaw, nevertheless in his conflicts with man he chiefly and contemptuously uses his tail. In striking at a boat he swiftly curves away his flukes from it, and the blow is only inflicted by the recoil. If it be made in the unobstructed air, especially if it descend to its mark, the stroke is then simply irresistible. No ribs of man or boat can withstand it. Your only salvation lies in eluding it. But if it comes sideways through the opposing water, then partly owing to the light buoyancy of the whale-boat, and the elasticity of its materials, a cracked rib or a dashed plank or two, a sort of stitch in the side, is generally the most serious result. These submerged side-blows are so often received in the fishery that they are accounted mere child's play. Someone strips off a frock, and the hole is stopped. Third, I cannot demonstrate it, but it seems to me that in the whale the sense of touch is concentrated in the tail, for in this respect there is a delicacy in it only equalled by the daintiness of the elephant's trunk. This delicacy is chiefly evinced in the action of sweeping, when in maidenly gentleness the whale with a certain soft slowness moves his immense flukes from side to side upon the surface of the sea and if he feels but a sailor's whisker, woe to that sailor, whiskers and all, what tenderness there is in that preliminary touch. Had this tale any prehensile power, I should straightway bethink me of Darmonides' elephant that so frequented the flower-market, and with low salutations presented nosegays to damsels, and then caressed their zones. On more accounts than one, a pity it is that the whale does not possess this prehensile virtue in his tail. For I have heard of yet another elephant that, when wounded in the fight, curved round his trunk and extracted the dart. Fourth, stealing unawares upon the whale in the fancied security of the middle of solitary seas, you find him unbent from the vast corpulence of his dignity, and kitten-like he plays on the ocean as if it were a hearth. But still you see his power in his play. The broad palms of his tail are flirted high into the air, then smiting the surface the thunderous concussion resounds for miles. You would almost think a great gun had been discharged, and if you notice the light wreath of vapour from the spiracle at his other extremity, you would think that that was the smoke from the touch-hole. Fifth, as in the ordinary floating posture of the Leviathan, the flukes lie considerably below the level of his back, they are then completely out of sight beneath the surface, but when he is about to plunge into the deeps, his entire flukes with at least thirty feet of his body are tossed erect in the air, and so remain vibrating a moment, till they downward shoot out of view. Excepting the sublime breach, somewhere else to be described, this peaking of the whale's flukes is perhaps the grandest sight to be seen in all animated nature. Out of the bottomless profundities the gigantic tail seems spasmodically snatching at the highest heaven. So in dreams have I seen majestic Satan thrusting forth his tormented colossal claw from the flame Baltic of hell. But in gazing at such scenes, it is all in all what mood you are in. If in the Dantean, the devils will occur to you. If in that of Isaiah, the archangels. Standing at the masthead of my ship during a sunrise that crimsoned sky and sea, I once saw a large herd of whales in the east, all heading towards the sun, and for a moment vibrating in concert with peaked flukes. As it seemed to me at the time, such a grand embodiment of adoration of the gods was never beheld, even in Persia, the home of the fire-worshippers. As Ptolemy Philopater testified of the African elephant, I then testified of the whale, pronouncing him the most devout of all beings. For, according to King Juba, the military elephants of antiquity often hailed the morning with their trunks uplifted in the profoundest silence. The chance comparison in this chapter between the whale and the elephant, so far as some aspects of the tail of the one and the trunk of the other are concerned, 
should not tend to place those two opposite organs on an equality, much less the creatures to which they respectively belong. For as the mightiest elephant is but a terrier to Leviathan, so, compared with Leviathan's tail, his trunk is but the stalk of a lily. The most direful blow from the elephant's trunk were as the playful tap of a fan, compared with the measureless crush and crash of the sperm whale's ponderous flukes, which, in repeated instances, have one after the other hurled entire boats with all their oars and crews into the air, very much as an Indian juggler tosses his balls. Footnote. Though all comparison in the way of general bulk between the whale and the elephant is preposterous, inasmuch as in that particular the elephant stands in much the same respect to the whale as a dog does to the elephant, nevertheless there are not wanting some points of curious similitude. Among these is the spout. It is well known that the elephant will often draw up water or dust in his trunk, and then, elevating it, jet it forth in a stream. End of footnote. The more I consider this mighty tale, the more do I deplore my inability to express it. At times there are gestures in it which, though they would well grace the hand of man, remain wholly inexplicable. In an extensive herd so remarkable occasionally are these mystic gestures that I have heard hunters who have declared them akin to Freemason signs and symbols, that the whale indeed by these methods intelligently conversed with the world nor are there wanting other motions of the whale in his general body, full of strangeness and unaccountable to his most experienced assailant. Dissect him how I may, then, I go but skin deep. I know him not, and never will. But if I know not even the tail of this whale, how understand his head? Much more how comprehend his face, when face he has none. Thou shalt see my back parts, my tail, he seems to say, but my face shall not be seen. But I cannot completely make out his back parts, and hint what he will about his face. I say again, he has no face. End of chapters 83 to 86